Well, good evening and welcome everyone. Tonight's webinar is hosted by Understanding Ag. And the title of the webinar this evening is Building Resiliency into Your Dairy. We fully understand that we have participants this evening from all across the spectrum. Everybody from small, predominantly grazing dairies to large dairies. And we have information this evening that we feel is very pertinent to you, no matter what type of dairy you operate and no matter where you may be located in the country. So we do wanna welcome everyone. Just a few things before we get started with tonight's webinar. Number one, please be sure and mute yourself so that we don't have any noise drowning out our presenters or interfering with other people trying to hear. So please be sure and keep yourself on mute. You can type in questions to, to submit questions. So we will have an extended Q&A period when we finish the webinar this evening and we'll do, we will do our best to get to everybody's question before the evening is through and we sign off. I also want to mention that we have a survey that Kathy Richburg will be sending to everybody tomorrow. We do like to get your feedback so that we can continue to both improve the webinars that we are bringing to you and also we can get your ideas for additional topics that you would like for us to present or provide more detail in. All of our webinars are recorded and will be available to you later on our understandingag.com website. So you can pop on that website in about a week or so and it will be available in an archived format. Just go under our webinar tab to past webinars and you can find both this evening's webinar in an archived format and many of our past webinars are also available on that same tab. So welcome again. And tonight's webinar, as I said before, is building resiliency into your dairy. So we're gonna start this evening with Kent Solberg. Kent is one of our consultants on understanding ag. And Kent is also a farmer himself, has been a dairy farmer for many years and has consulted with many dairy farmers. So he directly understands the challenges and concerns and issues that are faced by dairy farmers across the US. And Kent is gonna share with us some ways that we can consider to start to build that resiliency that is so necessary in any farming operation, but especially in a dairy operation. So Kent, I'm gonna turn it over to you, sir, to begin your presentation. Thank you, Alan, and welcome everyone. Good evening. Really glad you joined us this evening. Um, as Alan said, we have a wide variety of producers from all over the country with us today. So whether you have 30 cows or 30,000 cows, uh, there's a number of things we all have in common. And uh, that includes that we have cows. It also includes that we work with plants and that we work with the soil. And these are the basic things we're gonna spend our time on. And as a, some famous football coaches in the past have said after their team would lose a game, it's about returning to the fundamentals. And dairy's been a real struggle for so many of us for a number of years now, and this year's definitely been no exception. Uh, prices are up a little bit right now, and that's encouraging, but it's been tough. And so I think returning to the fundamentals uh, helps bring us, brings us all back to a baseline that we can look at, we can think about our operation, and move forward um, uh, making sure all these are covered. So as uh, 
guys like Alan and I go around to dairy farms and I've been going around to dairy farms for many years now, at least 11 years now that I've been working with dairies. Um, we're hearing a lot of concerns, particularly in the last year, there's some real commonalities. Big one, field conditions. So many in the Midwest uh, struggled uh, last year and even this spring with field conditions, with harvest and planting, uh, just a real battle. Feed, having enough volume and even sufficient quality. Uh, getting sufficient quality put up for our herds. That's been a, a big concern. Herd health, always a big concern when you're a dairy producer. Manure management uh, and all aspects of that, including regulatory uh, aspects of that is, is always a big concern. And then at the really the bottom line or profitability. Now fold it all into this, uh, each in, into many of these is also labor. I didn't put that up there because that ties to so many of this, but these are the common things we, we hear. And when we, we found that when we focus on the principles, the six principles of regenerative agriculture, which we're gonna be going through here tonight, we begin to really address each of these concerns at their core. So let's jump into those six principles here. Um, in the last 70 years, really in agriculture, the focus when it comes to soil has been on physical and chemical properties. Uh, the biological piece was discussed, but it was almost this mystical thing out there. We didn't get a really good handle on it. It's, it's fairly complicated, but in the last 10 or so years, we've, we've come to learn that this bio, biological piece is absolutely huge, and it has a huge influence on the physical and chemical uh, components of the soil. Really what we found out is that 90% of soil function is directly related to soil microbial activity. That's pretty powerful. So what is this thing called soil function? It's the ability of the soil to capture and store water and the ability to cycle nutrients. And as dairy farmers, we grow feed for our animals, we're growing, we're raising plants. Uh, these are critical to that forage production that our soil is able to capture and store water and cycle nutrients. So how do we make this happen? Well, there are six principles um, that we focus on in understanding ag. These six principles are universal to anywhere we do agriculture in the world. And one of the beauties of, of uh, dairy is that uh, we have a lot of the components already built in uh, to our, into our production system to make, make this happen. These six principles include uh, diversity, not only in plants, but in animals, keeping the soil armored, reducing disturbance, integrating livestock into our system, keeping a living root uh, in the ground as much as possible, and all this being done within the context of our farm. So in the next few moments, I'd like to dig into each of these six principles here and talk about how they relate to dairy. So number one, context. Context going to be different for each farm in each field. This includes your soils, your climate, regulations, cropping systems, available labor, and so on and so on. Uh, that we take into consideration uh, at each farm and each field. And this is something uh, we do as consultants with Understanding Ag, is sit down with the farmer and help them kind of create or paint this picture, put this puzzle together, if you will, on what's going on with that field and then explore options on how to address that. Number two, reducing disturbance. Now for many people, you know, things like no-till uh, come to mind, but one of the beauties of dairy is that we have the built-in ability into our production system uh, more often than not, the ability to extend that rotation out and include perennials. And as we include perennials in our rotation, uh, for those years, those perennials are there. We've basically reduced tillage or eliminated tillage uh, in our system, but it's not just tillage. We have to think about chemical disturbance also. And, and when we're talking about dairy, you know, all, all of us who have dairy, we have, we have manure we have to manage. And, how we manage that manure influences the level of disturbance we have on that soil microbial system. Dwayne Beck from Dakota LASIK Experiment Station talks about some of the negatives that uh, tillage tools can do. Uh, they do destroy soil structure. They reduce water infiltration by damaging that soil structure. They help, they burn through or help oxidize uh, organic matter. So it reduces organic matter and that all tillage uh, actually ends up increasing our weed problem. So something we wanna be cognizant about and look at ways to minimize that disturbance. Principle number three, 
keeping that soil armored or keeping that soil covered. This is a photo of bare soil from the USDA NRCS with a single drop of water hitting that bare soil. It's magnified and so we're seeing the full, full effect of that. There's quite a bit of kinetic energy uh, in that single drop of water hitting soil at about 20 miles an hour. And when we have soil moving like this, we basically have erosion. So protecting that soil from erosion is critical to reason to maintain armor. Also thermal protect, protection is very important. Uh, here's a picture of a thermometer in between some uh, corn rows in early to mid summer. Temperature that day was in the 90s. The bare soil at two inch depth is registering about 100 degrees. And yet just a few feet away, because this was a side by side comparison, where this producer had cover crops planted in between corn rows, the temperature was 20 degrees cooler. That has a huge implication on what sort of home or habitat uh, is available in the soil for those microbes. When our soil temperatures are 70 degrees, 100% of the moisture in that soil is available for plant growth. But when soil temperatures get to 100 degrees, 85% of that moisture is lost to evaporation and transportation. We got a hot spell going on in the upper Midwest today. And uh, you know, it was 92, 92 at our place today. It was pretty warm. And uh, um, anything we can do to keep that ground shaded and protect that is going to reduce uh, the impact of evaporation. And a lot of us in the upper Midwest are dealing with some pretty dry conditions right now. Now, some are hoping to dry out, but some are too dry. And so being able to protect that moisture is going to be critical if this drought continues. At 130 degrees, 100% 100 of the moisture is lost through evaporation and transportation. And we've documented the temperatures these, uh, this high on bare soils uh, when we've been on individual farms. And at 140 degrees, soil biology is severely affected. It, it basically begins to die. A lot of us are familiar with sites like this in our crop fields where the ground is crusted and cracked. And for many of us, we think this is normal. And yet this crusted and cracked condition repels water and it keeps air out. And yet air and water are essential uh, for keeping the microbes in the soil healthy, just like they're essential for us, just like they're essential for the cows. Um, we have to create an opportunity for air and water to get in there. The organisms that are in the soil are subaquatic. They move around on thin, thin films of water, and so they need that water, but they need that balance of water and air. Number four, diversity. And I'm gonna focus on plant diversity here, but I should take a look at this complex cover crop how many different plants do you see? There's quite a few here. There's a lot of diversity here. But let's compare that to this slide. How many plants do we seed here? And yet this is normal for what most of our crop fields look like. What we like to see in a sound, ag in sound agronomic rotation is representatives of each of these major agronomic crop types, warm season grasses, warm season broadleaves, cool season grasses, and cool season broadleaves. Dr. Buzz, Buzz Klute says we should see 15 different plants over the course of three years in our rotation. And we think, good grief, how are we gonna do that? But that's one of the beauties of cover crops. We have lots of options out there and lots of ability to do that if we're intentional about doing it. There's just some examples listed here in uh, the white letters on uh, samples of each one of those. And it's by no means an exhaustive list. We also wanna include uh, examples from each of the plant functional groups, preferably at least one from each of these functional groups every year, uh, or at least one and preferably three, I should say, um, from each of these. In fact, when we work with producers, to design complex cover crop blends, we strive to have examples of three grasses, three forbs, and three legumes in complex cover crop mixes. And again, there's just some examples stated here. When we have this diversity out there, it gives us the ability to optimize our solar um, collection. We have many different sizes and shapes of leaves that take full advantage of every angle of the sun to capture every amount of sunlight that's out there. You know, next week is the peak of summer here, the, the most daylight uh, uh, throughout the year. And just having this diverse array out here, we can, excuse me, really do a lot of work in capturing all that sunlight. Well, why is that so important? 
Um, it's to stimulate what's going on below ground with the microbes. When we have diverse plants, we also have diverse root systems. Many of these microbes are only associated with a specific plant. And the more complex of a root system we have out there, the more diverse microbial, microbial associations we'll have with that plant community. We can also optimize animal health through our um, through, through increased plant diversity. Um, Dr. Fred Provenza, now retired from Utah State, uh, has identified that ruminants will select from 30 to 75 different plant species a day, given that they have the opportunity. Now the bulk of their diets made up of three, maybe four different plant species, but the opportunity to select from a broader array of species greatly enhances animal health. There are phytochemicals produced by individual plants that, and thousands of them have been identified, and each of them plays a different role in maintaining animal health. For example, there are tannins in some plants, and we know tannins have some antiparasitic properties uh, in them. So just a little bit of this and a little bit of that can go an extremely long way um, to helping that an animal meet, meet its health needs. We typically build our rations around a mean or around an average, and yet if you look at scatter plots to where those animals are or anything else around any particular mean, very few organisms within that population fall exactly on that mean for various reasons, whether it's gestation, lactation, temperature, stress, whatever, they're at different parts of that nutritional plane on any given day. And so having that wide array of plants is critical um, to animal optimizing animal health. So how do we do this? Well, we can do this with polycultures. Here's just two examples of corn that was interseeded with cover crops. So these pictures are taken after harvest. Uh, th this is something that could be grazed uh, as an example, but it's a way to build some diversity into, a, into a, a forage crop or a cash crop we already need. We can use complex cover crop mixes uh, for grazing or even for harvest. You know, the fact that we have access to Kemper heads uh, for har harvesting silage makes something like this very doable. Uh, cover crops after small grains or any short season crop, uh, there's oftentimes in many places of the country a, still a window of opportunity in the growing season um, to get a diverse cover crop in there that may be available for grazing or even forage harvest. We can use winter biennials, cereal rye, triticale, hairy vetch, uh, winter wheat, and so on uh, can be used and built into a broader rotation. Here's just one example from Minnesota where we did three crops in two years on one dairy. Corn silage, it was a short day corn. It was harvested September 1st. Cereal rye was planted in shortly after that. That cereal rye was chopped for forage the following spring. And then a short day soybean was planted after that. And then just so you know how well those soybeans actually did, they harvested 62 bushel and acre beans off that June 10th planting. So it, it can be done and we can still have very productive crops uh, even in tight windows in Northern climates like Minnesota. These are some dairy polycultures for silage and even grain. I've seen dairy farmers use uh, corgum, corn and sorghum, corn and sunflowers, corn and forage soybeans, oats, barley, peas all mixed together and taken as, as uh, silage. Um, the trick here is particularly on anything with corn is matching your uh, maturity dates as closely as possible um, to maximize the harvest window for forage quality there. I've also worked with dairy producers who've used the old succotash mix of oat, barley, spring wheat and thrown field peas in, let it go to full maturity and combine that. And use it as the basis uh, of a ration, uh, not only for their dairy cows, but it was a great one even for calves and, and heifers. And so a uh, great way to build diversity into the rotation. Our hay crop blends. You know, now that most of us put up haylage or baleage, uh, and have the opportunity to put up wet feed, uh, we can add other things to that alfalfa crop out there. We can add clovers, we can add chicory, we can add a variety of grasses and build diversity. And as the animal nutrition uh, research tells us, grasses increase cud chewing and aid in rumen function. And so we can benefit not only our soil biology, but also the biology uh, in that rumen. Uh, and we know uh, from a lot of our work that increasing plant diversity, we don't see linear 
increases in biological activity, it's exponential increases in biological activity. Keeping a living root in the soil. This is where it all happens. You know, and unfortunately, most of our crop fields only see a living root about one third of the entire year. There's not a lot of bio biology going on in a field that's managed like this. But if we keep a living root in the system, even during the winter, uh, during cold temperatures, you can see the green plants here. Yes, it's suppressed. It's, it's not as active as it is now in June uh, in North America but uh, there's certainly biological activity going on here and that's beneficial um, to overall soil health and function. This is how it really all happens, energy flow. We have to have a green plant in order to have photosynthesis and one of the products is photosynthesis, uh, photosynthesis is carbohydrates or sugar that are giving off and plants are willing to give up some of that sugar. Here's a picture of a root tip or a root hair uh, giving off some of those photosynthetically produced sugars. And at first this looks a little bit wasteful, but what's going on here is that plant is trading or bartering those sugars, if you will, with the microbes in exchange for access to nutrients and water that the plant itself can't reach. And so by giving up some of these sugars as a payment, if you will, in exchange for those uh, other things the plant need, uh, everybody benefits. It's a very symbiotic system. It's supporting the soil food web and we have to have a fully functioning soil food web in order to build soil aggregation. And when we have good soil aggregation and good soil aggregation, you can see some, some uh, few earthworms uh, here. There's one there, there's the one there. Uh, when we have good soil aggregation, um, we have the ability of that soil to handle water. I believe this picture was taken shortly after 13 inches of rain uh, came down. And uh, it's, it's pretty phenomenal how this well aggregated soil can handle that. And it's only through healthy microbes that we can have that. Uh, when we have good well aggregated soil, uh, our soils can handle traffic and um, it can support a lot more equipment. Uh, we routinely hear producers who say, I didn't run up my fields during harvest when they start moving down this regenerative path. Uh, I was able to get in the field and do work when my neighbors couldn't get in. I didn't get stuck this year. Uh, I talked to a farmer last week who said every one of his neighbors had to have a track hoe out at least once this spring in order to get equipment that was stuck in the mud. He didn't have to do that. He had some rutting, that went on, but he didn't have to bring a track hoe in. And he's been working towards soil health for a couple of years now. We can take that carbon that's in the atmosphere and use it as fuel uh, for the system. Uh, carbon is the, the fuel that drives the microbial system. Um, when we have, as we've already talked about, healthy soils, it's gonna increase our animal performance. Um, one of the big concerns coming out, and we've all heard this in the press, is you know the, the accusation that, that dairy is the reason for a big part of the reason for greenhouse gas emissions and a way to combat that or a way to counter that, if you will, is by building uh, a good soil aggregate structure. Um, it's been well demonstrated that we can greatly reduce that even though we have a livestock operation. And then less weed and pest pressure. And I think uh, most farmers would be very happy with that. Number six, animal impact or animal integration. There are many, many ways to do this. And this is, this is the one that gets some dairy farmers kind of raising some eyebrows uh, uh, on what they're doing. But let's talk about this uh, just a little bit here. Um, last September in Progressive Forage Magazine, they ran an article about heifer development, heifer development being the second largest dairy expenditure. In confinement systems, they quoted a buck and a half to 250 per head per day. Uh, Alan and I saw some numbers this last year uh, that were showing over $3 per head per day with, with feed costs and labor costs and so on. So it can be pretty expensive. Um, they were showing numbers of around 43 cents per head per day during a six month grazing season. Now, no, this isn't all year round, so they just use six months, but even with six months, it demonstrated an overall cost savings of about 35 to 50% per head. And that can be substantial with a one of your largest or second largest cost on a dairy being that heifer development. So we look at heifers as a tool and some people are concerned about, 
where when they can do this and that's something we certainly work with folks on um, but it's pretty doable here's some other data uh, this is from uh, Larry Trannell uh, from a few years ago here um, I'm not going to wade too deep in the numbers here but I do want you to take a look at what they were uh, charging for land rent $250 an acre which means they were saying that on some really good crop ground this can be highly profitable. So if the value of gain uh, at a buck and a half uh, uh, per pound uh, here on those heifers, potential net return for management to $539. And even at a buck a pound, it was $239. Um, it's pretty hard to find somebody growing corn the last few years who can match uh, those levels or those numbers of return to management. So it can be done. How do those animals perform um, uh, once they come out of? Well, we've got uh, some work here out of Minnesota a few years ago, and they, um, they looked at animals on a rotationally grazed system and a feedlot system, and just look at the number of health issues, the difference in health issues between animals in a feedlot and animals out grazing. Um, there's certainly some value here and some return on investment uh, for doing this. Here's some other uh, research that was done on animal performance, um, both during uh, the time they were on pasture versus confinement, and then how they performed uh, during that first lactation uh, coming out of there. And it's about a 1,900 pound difference in milk there. Um, I'll let you do the math. You know, Take your current milk price uh, right now, or your average milk price for the last year, multiply that by 1,900 pounds and you can put a dollar figure um, to something like that. So there's definitely some value here. There's definitely some potential. And we see heifers as really a tool or an opportunity um, to integrate uh, livestock into cropping systems. Even, even the dairy herd. Um, and I know some of you are on some very big dairies and you think, how can I do this? Or is it, is it possible? South Dakota State University did some research a few years ago here. They took animals off of a silage-based ration and put them on complex covers, similar to like uh, what we see here in the picture. And they saw no significant main change in milk production when they did that. Now, a lot are thinking, wow, you know, I got thousands of cows and I only have a few hundred acres around there. Um, a lot of us have pens that we've got different lactation groups in there, or we've got dry cows. Uh, there may be opportunities there. If, we're, if, we're, if we separate our cows by individual pens based on their performance or how they're functioning, whether they're high somatic, whether they're low producers, whether they're late lactation, those may be some cows, there may be some opportunity here. The point of this is, is it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Uh, the picture on your screen is a heat stress and temperature humidity index chart here. We've probably all seen these. We probably use something like this for triggering when the barn fans and misters come on. And uh, we can use this tool to decide if we can graze. Larry Trannell out of Iowa State's done some excellent work demonstrating how hybrid dairies, dairies that use their freestall facility on, on days where animals would be stressed, and on nice days where uh, they would do just fine being out using, using a hybrid model um, where they're either out grazing or they're in their um, confinement situation uh, for weather reasons with the focus being on cow comfort. And isn't that what we've been talking about in dairy for the last 10, 15 years here? Cow comfort, cow comfort, cow comfort. We can continue to focus on that, use tools like this chart, you know, we've all got a device in our pocket that we can get the weather uh, at, at any time, anywhere, the forecast, the radar, the humidity. Uh, we can use a combination of these tools to make decisions on when animals are in and when animals are out. People often ask about forage quality, particularly later in the year. Uh, this picture was taken in November in Minnesota, a complex cover crop mix. We did a forage analysis on it. There's our numbers, and I think most of us would agree that's dairy quality feed. Uh, that's out there. We use adaptive high stock density grazing uh, because it does two things for us. It feeds the cattle and feeds the soil biology. Now I know a lot of us were brought up in an area where we were told if we left that amount of feed out there the farm was going to go broke. 
But what we're finding is that if we can do this on a portion of the farm, feeding the soil biology as well as the animal, we can greatly increase forage production, animal health, and even ultimately profitability uh, over time. And this is what makes it work. It's modern fence technology. Um, if, if the last time you've been around cattle on pasture was on grandpa's place back in 1974 and it was five strand barbed wire that was cobbled together, things have changed. Uh, this is highly, highly effective. Um, animals can uh, be trained to something like this. It goes up a whole lot easier than barbed wire fencing and and uh, yeah, there's some really uh, innovative designs, tools, and techniques that make this uh, very, very labor efficient and cost effective. So with that, I am going to turn it back to Alan, and he's going to talk about um, some more information here I think you'll find interesting. Okay, thank you, Kent. Very much appreciated. And we are going to dive into the second portion of this evening's webinar. So Kent covered the six principles of soil health. And those principles need to be well understood if you want to build a high degree of resiliency within your within your dairy operation they're they're absolutely critical the next thing that we need to understand are what we call the three rules of adaptive stewardship and if we appropriately apply the six principles of soil health and the three rules of adaptive stewardship we will make significant and profound changes in our dairy farms that will allow us to be able to enjoy a significantly higher level of resilience, of productivity, and of profitability. So in, in the years that I have spent farming, I have learned this one thing that nature will humble you. And if you refuse to be humbled, then she will not only humble you, but she will defeat you. For many years, I spent a lot of time trying to fight nature. And, and frankly, even prided myself on that. We, as farmers, we talk a lot about how we have to fight nature. Well, that never really works, folks, never. And again, nature will defeat us if, if we try to do that. And since then, I've tried to practice what is quoted here by Wendell Berry in that agricultural choices must be made by these inescapable standards, the ecological health of the farm and the economic health of the farmer. We have a problem, quite frankly, with both of these today. We have a lot of farms across the U.S. and all of North America and even across the world that are experiencing significant issues with their ecological health. Farmers are dealing with degraded soils, degraded resources, erosion, runoff, many, many other factors that are, that are harming the ability of that farm to be truly profitable and resilient. And we are certainly struggling with our economics on many farms. Uh, I saw a very, very recent report that states that through May of 2020, farm bankruptcy filings in the U.S. have increased across the entire country by 23%. But it's much worse than that in the Midwest and the upper Midwest. When we look at farm bankruptcy filings through May of 2020 in that region of the country, they have risen 42%. And we are actually in our fifth consecutive year of increasing numbers of farm bankruptcy filings. 
So those are some of the things that we're dealing with, and that's why it's so terribly important that we understand these principles and these rules so that we can begin to apply them to our farms and we can begin to build that valuable resiliency. So what are the three rules of adaptive stewardship? They are simply the rule of compounding, the rule of diversity, and the rule of disruption. No matter what you're grazing or growing, these three rules apply, as do the six principles of soil health. So it doesn't matter what kind of agriculture we're practicing, these still apply and they apply very strongly. So let's look at the rule of compounding. Now, if you've heard me speak before, you've heard me talk about this, but it is critically important that you really grasp and understand this. In nature and in biology, which is what we deal with every day in farming, we never experience singular effects or impact. Everything that we, that we experience from the soil up are compounding cascading effects. And those compounding cascading effects are never neutral in nature. They're always either positive or negative. Now the good thing here is that we can actually influence whether they're positive or not by the way that we manage our farms, both our, our soils and the plants that grow in them and our livestock. So we have a lot to say about whether we're going to be experiencing positive compounding and cascading effects or negative compounding effects. So again, everything that we do, everything we apply, everything we feed to our cattle, every supplement, every pharmaceutical, every management decision creates these series of compounding events. And as soon as we start to understand that, and really grasp that, then we now have a better basis for decision making. It allows us to think through the process of what occurs if I do this thing versus the other thing. And we can begin to make decisions that are far, far better, both in the short term and the long term. Now, many of you, since you're dairy producers, have probably also heard of epigenetics. And I'm gonna give you a quick, simple definition. Epigenetics is the influence of environmental factors, nutrition, pharmaceuticals, chemicals, synthetics, climate, and so forth, on degree of gene expression in an individual. So on a dairy farm, epigenetics affects practically every organism that you deal with. It certainly affects your cattle. It most certainly affects the plants that you're growing to feed to those cattle. It affects the organisms on and in the soil, the beneficial insects, earthworms, and so forth. And it affects the microbial organisms that are so critically important in that soil. So epigenetic effects play a huge role in what occurs and they're never neutral. They are always also compounding and cascading in effect and they are either positive or negative. But the issue with epigenetics is that they are also transgenerational in nature. So what we do today how we manage our, our cows, how we manage those developing heifers, how we manage our gestating, our pregnant cows, how we manage our soils matters, and it matters a lot because it's going to impact the epigenetics of not just that current generation, but the next and the next and the next. And research now tells us we know that epigenetic effects can last through at least 19 generations. The next rule is the rule of diversity. We want highly diverse and complex pastures and 
annual cover crop mixes that we plant in between our cash crops and our row crop fields, not monocultures. So if we're planting cover crops, we wanna make sure, and Kent brought this up earlier and I'll talk about it more here in just a second, but we want diverse cover crop mixes because they're gonna help repair and replenish what was damaged through the monoculture cash crop, the corn that we planted for our silage or grain production, or the wheat that we planted. And as Kent alluded to, we want to make sure that at least three of the primary functional plant class groups are represented, both in our perennial pastures and in the annual cover crop mixes that we're going to plant. And the three classes that we look at most often are grasses, legumes, and forbs. It's very, very important that we have all three of these represented. So when we talk about a diverse cover crop mix, if we put three, four, five, or even six grasses in that mix, it's still not a diverse mix. It's an all grass mix. It's only diverse when we also add in multiple functional class groups. Now, why do we want that? Why do we want diversity? Well, first of all, plant species diversity always creates, and I do emphasize that word always, always creates positive compounding and cascading effects because those fields are gonna be working much more closely in synchrony with nature and the biology in and above the soil. So diversity in plants produces compound, positive compounding cascading effects. Secondly, diversity in plants produces a much broader array of secondary and tertiary plant compounds, also known as plant phytonutrients. These phytonutrients we are finding through some very crucial research done by Dr. Fred Provenza and a number of others are critical for the health of not just the plants and our soil, but also for the health of our cows and those developing heifers. The, and when we have monocultures and near monocultures, our animals do not get exposed to this rich, very complex array of plant phytonutrients that are not only providing additional nutritive value to their diet, but also providing an entire array of pharmaceutical and antiparasitic compounds to their diet. As Kent said earlier, given the opportunity, and, and we certainly know this now with our own experience on our own farms, our livestock will eat 30, 40, 50, 60, or more different plants a day if we have that many plants in our mix. A little of some, a lot of others, and they'll alter the proportion of different plant species that they consume day by day, depending on the dietary needs that they know that they have. And the only way that we can achieve that is through creating diversity in those cover crop mixes that we may be grazing or diversity in those perennial pastures. Secondly, diversity in microbial species is created when we have greater plant species diversity. Every type of plant exudes a different array of root exudates that attract and feed different types of microbial species. So if we want to build diversity and population mass in our microbial species in the soil, we can only do that effectively through increasing diversity in our plant species. Diversity in plant species also creates far greater diversity in the macroorganisms in the soil. And Kent said this earlier, these impacts are not linear in nature, but exponential in nature. So diversity is the key. Now, when we look at the work of Dr. Fred Provenza, I, I want to just hone in on this diversity deal just a little more and present 
some of the things that Fred and his coworkers have found. So one of the things that they talk about quite often is that in their work, they have determined that landscapes with diverse arrays of plants are incredible nutrition centers and pharmacies that contain vast arrays of phytochemicals or phytonutrients. And they have found that nothing is more important in our landscapes than having a wide variety of foods for our herbivores, hence our cattle, our omnivores and carnivores that are both above and below the soil surface. And what we have certainly found is that when we have a greater array of plant species diversity for these animals to graze on, health improves not just a little bit, but a lot. When, we, when they're able to graze these much broader arrays of plants, they can consume these plant pharmaceuticals, tannins, and so forth that help them to perform more efficiently. They gain weight more efficiently. And oh, by the way, as Kent talked about, one of the, one of the dings that we keep getting in the livestock sector and the dairy and beef sectors are, are the two major ones that everybody talks about. Our cattle are emitting methane and, 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 and we've got to do something about that. Well, what we have found is that when you have far greater array of plant species out there, then we have far better functioning and cycling of these greenhouse gases from carbon to nitrous oxide to methane and so forth. And we've even done work placing what are called flux towers out on these farms that give us 24 seven streaming data looking at the impact of grazing in diverse pastures. And we have found that this is absolutely the case, that we have significantly lower greenhouse gas emissions where we have these far greater arrays coupled with far greater health of the livestock. Now this health status, again, is also epigenetic in nature. So if we have pregnant heifers, for instance, out there grazing diverse mixes with their first calf in gestation, what we have found is that we have fetal imprinting or fetal programming going on that is very positive. It's a, it's a positive epigenetic effect. And not only will those heifers, but the calves born out of those heifers will perform far better throughout their lifetime. They will have a far better health status. That means that when you'll have far less somatic cell issues, mastitic issues, MUNS issues, those types of things, less pink eye, less foot rot, uh, and you will have far greater milk component production. So, the, the benefits are all positive here, folks. And dairy producers that are adopting these practices are finding that morbidity and mortality decrease significantly when they're developing their calves on forage on a diverse mix of plants versus monoculture pastures. So this is an important point. Many of you out there listening this evening have probably tried some form of grazing, some more than others, and you're saying, well, wait a minute, Alan and Kent, we haven't seen these types of benefits that you're talking about tonight. So the immediate question that I have to ask is, what kind of diversity was in those pastures? Were these pastures monoculture or low diversity pastures? And how were you grazing these pastures? Because that has, everything to do with whether you're going to experience the positive benefits that we're talking about or not. And again, it means that it's critical that you develop this diversity. Now again, Fred clearly points out, and, and there's actually a host of research, not just Fred's, but, but research from many others around the world now that show us clearly that plants and not just animals in humans, but plants also are sentient beings. 
they see, they smell, they taste, they talk, they listen, they breathe. So plants do all the things that we think about our animals doing, we think about us doing. They see different wavelengths of light, which they capture in the process of photosynthesis. And as a part of that photosynthetic process, they breathe through the stomata on the surface of their leaves and stems. And they smell, taste, talk, and listen in a biochemical language that, that they clearly understand. They can detect biochemical compounds in the air, in their roots, on their tissues. And they can even hear and respond to the sound of, say, a caterpillar eating on a neighboring plant. And then that signals them to start to produce volatile compounds that if we have a very solid mycorrhizal fungi population developed underneath the surface of the soil, interconnecting our plant roots, then that mycorrhizal pathway can rapidly transmit those volatile compounds from plant to plant to plant to protect them from the pest. So one of the reasons we have to use so many insecticides and fungicides and so forth today is that we have so destroyed our mycorrhizal fungi population beneath the soil surface that our farms are lacking the ability to be able to transmit these volatile compounds from plant to plant and protect themselves from insect predators and, and fungal diseases. And the roots of the plant do the same thing. They have active interaction on a 24 seven basis with fungi and bacteria in the soil, which are collectively known as the plant microbiome. So it's not just the plant itself that forms this microbiome, but the microbiome is also a function of the fungi and bacteria that interact with the plant roots. And so as these plant roots forage for water and nutrients, they're sending out these root exudates and transferring energy from the roots to the soil to attract the soil microbes because the microbes can do a far more efficient and effective job at foraging for water and nutrients and feeding it back to the plants. And these root exudates contain primary and secondary metabolites or these phytochemicals that we've been talking about if we have a diverse array of plants, then these exudates can attract, deter, or even kill below ground insect herbivores, nematodes, and microbes that potentially harm our plants and our crops. So cells and the plants they make up have knowledge and they enact that knowledge each and every day, as a matter of fact, every minute of every day. They receive environmental challenges and they have a cellular memory. So do your cattle, by the way. They have a cellular memory. And so the microbes in the soil, the plants that those microbes are feeding, and then the animals that feed upon those plants all have cellular memory. And the cellular memory, we're going to talk about more in just a minute as to why that's so vital when we talk about the rule of disruption. They remember how they've been grazed. Your cattle remember how they've been grazed. They remember what they grazed, when they grazed at the stage of development or maturity those forages were at when they grazed it. They remember the, uh, you know, the number of plant species that were in the mix when they grazed. So everything has cellular memory and responds accordingly. So plants behave in a way that clearly show us that they have intelligent behavior. So this leads to the third and final rule, the rule of disruption. And the first thing that we need to realize and recognize is that nature has tremendous resilience and responds well to challenges. And I use an analogy often, and again, if you've heard me speak, you've heard me use this analogy before, but I use the analogy of a human athlete. 
if we as humans are to improve as an athlete, then we cannot do the same exercise routine day after day at the same duration and same intensity. We will quickly hit a wall and our progress will completely stagnate. And then we can't even maintain our performance at that point, we'll actually start going backwards. We'll start digressing. So the only way as an athlete that we continue to improve ourselves and our performance is we have to routinely alter our exercise routine. We have to change the intensity, the duration, the timing, and so forth, so that we continuously challenge our body, every cell in our body and our brains. And again, remember, every cell has cellular memory. So the more we alter and challenge those cells, the more they're going to grow because they're going to say, I haven't experienced this before, so I need to get bigger, stronger, more resilient so that I can stand up to this the next time this type of challenge occurs. That's the way our bodies grow. That's the way we become faster, stronger, have greater endurance. It's the same way in nature. Biology is biology. It doesn't matter whether it's the biology in our bodies or it's the biology in the bodies of our cattle or in the plants or in those microbes in the soil. They all respond the same way to these challenges. So what we've learned is that we can introduce planned purposeful disruptions that allow us to be able to continue to make progress as we move forward. And these planned purposeful disruptions create a host of positive compounding effects. So how do we do that? Well, the first way is simply don't do things the same way every time. But this is what's so hard for us, isn't it? As farmers, we like a formula. We like a recipe. We like a routine. We want to do things the same way every time, day after day, year after year. But that's our problem. That's why we keep hitting walls. That's why we keep or, or, or we quit making progress. And then we wonder why. So, you know, we'll, we'll decide that we're going to change something and it works. And we're like, great, wonderful. I changed this and it worked. So now I'm going to do that every time from this point forward. Well, we just made another critical mistake. We changed something which was good, it worked, which was good, but then we decided that's the key from forever and ever, and I'm just going to make that into my formula. That's my new recipe. Well, in just a few short years or even months at times, we find out that is not working as well as it did when we first changed something, and we wonder why. So we want to determine how we can be disruptive. So in our grazing, and again, as Kent talked about, no matter how small of a dairy or how large of a dairy you are, you do have opportunities to graze. You can graze, graze dry cows, you can graze developing heifers, you can graze pregnant heifers. You, can, you have more grazing acres at certain times of the year than you might imagine. Every crop acre is a potential grazing acre when you have complex cover crops in there in between your cash crops. So we have far greater opportunities to graze than we may have thought about, but what are some of the things that we can change to have planned purposeful disruptions in our grazing? Well, one of the first things is alter stock density on a per acre basis. Stock density is not stocking rate. Stocking rate is number of head per acre or acres per head. Stock density is all about pounds per acre. So we purposefully and routinely alter stock densities on any given acre. I call this pulsing of stock density. Also, when in your grazing program, do not move through your pastures in the same rotation year after year. Alter that rotational pattern. So when you start spring grazing every year, and you've, every year you've been starting in pasture A, then you move to B, C, D, and E, stop it. Next year, start in pasture D first. It makes a profound difference. We, and you may be asking yourself right now, or even saying, Alan, I don't understand that. I, 
how in the world can that make any kind of meaningful difference? Do it and you'll find out. It makes a very significant difference. Again, because of cellular memory in the soil microbes, in the plants, and in your livestock themselves. Another disruption, alter grazing heights on and off. Now, many of you that are dairy grazers, particularly dairy grazers, beef grazers are guilty of this as well, but dairy grazers even more so. You feel like you've got to always keep your plants highly, highly vegetative and that you need a whole lot of legume in your pasture. And I, I'm, I'm going to tell you that we're finding both of those are not true. And your cattle will perform a lot better and you'll have greater longevity and health and milk component production out of them if you graze closer to mid-stage maturity and you lower that legume component critically important and so altering the heights that you go on and come off from time to time can be critically important and make a big difference also alter paddock rest periods and again many dairy farmers feel like okay i've got to be back on this paddock every 21 days every 30 days every 35 days like clockwork well if you do that you're hitting a brick wall I can already tell you that you you have quit making progress and you're having issues if you've been doing that a while and you're wondering why and also your plant species diversity has narrowed you cannot maintain and grow plant species diversity by hitting a paddock every 21 30 35 days over and over and over again year after year it will not work you've got to alter those paddock rest periods on a purposeful basis and we do this by just purposefully skipping a paddock from time to time. Another thing that you can do is alter the time of season or year that you're in a specific pasture on your farm. Again, you'll find that many of us as farmers, we, we tend to be in a certain pasture year after year at about the same time every year. Cellular memory, that pasture remembers that. Every organism in that pasture remembers that. And, and it starts to digress, it doesn't improve. So altering this can make a profound difference. So what's the best tool in your toolbox? It's simply this, observation. Keen, daily, strong observation. Use all your senses, the sense of sight, sound, smell, touch, and yes, even taste. Observe the soil, the plants, the insects, the birds, the livestock. And if we make a practice of doing daily observation in our fields and of our livestock, real, real strong observation, not just a glance, but spending time purposefully observing, then that observation will allow you to develop keen intuition. And when we develop keen intuition, we start to make far better decisions. So it's all about observing everything that's around us on a day-to-day -day basis. If you, if you do that, every one of these organisms that you see pictured here and many more will actually speak to you. They will start to tell you what you need to be doing to improve your farms. And I'm gonna end with this. There are some very simple tools that you can use to help you in first of all, establishing your baseline where do you stand right now in terms of soil health, water infiltration rates, and soil aggregate, and all of these types of things. And then these tools can help you establish a barometer for monitoring and measuring progress going forward. So these tools are all very expensive, high-tech tools like a shovel. So a spade or sharpshooter is best. That's what I like to use. Small, simple, easy to, to carry with me. Uh, and, and my UTV, my truck or whatever as I travel across the farm. But routinely dig in your soil. Stick a shovel in the soil so that you can learn about the aggregate in your soil, the life beneath the soil surface, the aroma of the soil. What's going on there? carry a thermometer with you. You can use uh, uh, an infrared or thermal thermometer if you want to, and these are hugely helpful. 
and they allow you to very quickly and accurately assess soil surface and beneath the soil surface temperature. One of the things that we find is that in row crop fields and when you graze down too tight, that these soil temperatures can heat up enormously. Uh, I've, we've been in New Mexico and Florida and Mississippi and many other places over just the last handful of weeks. And as a part of what we've been doing there, we've been measuring soil temperatures. And I can tell you that everywhere that we've been in soils that were exposed by either being grazed down too much or, or plowed, tilled, whatever, uh, that these soils we've been monitoring temperatures over the last three weeks of 140 to 145 degrees. That's deadly to your microbes in the soil. And that means that you have evaporated all of your soil moisture, your soil moisture is gone. But yet, it, just a few feet away in these same fields in all of these different regions of the country that we've been in, we have found areas where you have a lot of plant cover. And so at the same time of the day, where just a few feet away, we measured soils that were 130, 140, 145 degrees, a few feet away where we have adequate plant cover and shading of the soil. We had soil temperatures in the 70s and 80s. So an incredible difference. And again, just a few paces away. A refractometer to measure plant bricks. And we have a lot of information on plant bricks that's available to you, but this is very helpful in monitoring the nutrient density in your pastures, in your annual cover crop mixes, and in your row crops. This is a great way when you're growing your corn and, and, and your small grains, everything else that you're gonna grow to put up into your silages, measuring those plants, the, the plant bricks level, B-R-I-X, is a great way to discern the ultimate nutrient density that's going to be in that silage that you're feeding your cattle. And then the fourth tool is a water infiltration ring. Very simple, you can just take six inch irrigation pipe and cut a six inch limp section. And of course there's six inches in diameter. You can use a, you can use a six inch diameter PVC pipe if you want to and just bevel the edge that you're going to drive into the soil. So you just take a six inch by six inch pipe, drive it into the soil about three inches, so halfway the length of the pipe and you take cellophane and, and there's YouTube videos that clearly explain how to do this, but you take cellophane, put it in there, pour a bottle of water, 444 milliliters in, into that, that equates to a, a, a acre inch of water. Gently pull the cellophane out and time the amount of time that it takes for the water to infiltrate and then repeat that process for a second inch and time that second inch. This gives you a very, very good indicator of the degree of soil aggregate and the ability of your soil to infiltrate water or not. All of these tools are cheap and easy to use, so take advantage of them. We, we highly encourage you to do that. And again, they allow you to be able to track and monitor your progress. So the last thing I wanna say is that there are striking similarities between the microbiome of the human animals, plants, and the soil. They are intricately linked in either a symbiotic or antagonistic relationship. The way we manage and the things that we apply have a lot to do with whether they're symbiotic or antagonistic. What happens with one inevitably affects the other. We cannot separate the microbiomes between animals, plants, and the soil. And we also have to remember, as I talked about earlier, these interactions produce epigenetic effects that are either positive or negative in nature and are certainly transgenerational. So with that, I'm going to open us up for questions for the evening. So please feel free to type in your questions.
and we would be very happy to address any questions, concerns, or even comments. Uh, please feel free to make comments. Okay, we just had a comment from Patrick. This was super helpful and informative. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so we just have a question here. Where's the best place for a dairy farmer to start? So thank you for that question. And honestly, the very best place to start is educating yourself on the six principles of soil health and the three rules of adaptive stewardship. Again, to make progress, you've got to really understand those six principles and the three rules. And then you can look at how to start applying them on your farm. And on a lot of dairy farms, all of you are growing crops to feed to your cattle, unless you're a 100% a grass-fed dairy. So, one of the best places to start is with your crop production. And, and the way that we can do that is we can look at greatly reducing our tillage practices, moving to no-till, and by planting complex cover crop mixes in between our cash crops so that we can start repairing and rebuilding the issues that we've encountered through the uh the the year after year of of these these monoculture cash crops kent do you have anything else to add to where is the best place for a dairy producer to start i would maybe not best but the easiest and and also the best is going to be just looking like alan said at building covers but diversity in your rotation diversity in your forages uh, what else can we use in forages and in successionary plantings um, where you can start to get uh, tonnages that are very similar, um, but we can build a lot of diversity. Interseeding covers into your cash crops. I had those pictures of covers interseeded with corn. Um, three crops in two years and building diversity into that instead of just rye, do rye and vetch. Instead of just silage corn, do silage corn with covers built into that. So there's all sorts of different ways we can do that. Again, as we talked about earlier, context is critical. We have to look at the context of what's your soil type. We have to look at the context and how you want to use that, how you're going to harvest that, what's been the management history on that field for the last few years, uh, what's your plans for next year, what's, you know, all those things come into play. And so, um, a few years ago, one of the cover crop seed companies sat down on a kind of a slow day and identified up to 150 potential different species that can be used for cover crops in North America. Now, not every one may work where you're at, but let's say 50 or 75 or 100 of those 150 could work where you're at. That's absolutely huge. Plus the diversity we can build into our hay crops and then maybe ultimately using some of those as grazing. Great place to start. Another great place to start is where and how are you raising those dairy replacement heifers? What, and how about your dry cows? Where are they? Where are they in proximity to hay ground or something that could have cover crops on it where we could start integrating livestock? Again, it doesn't have to be every day on every acre all the time. We want to be adaptive. We don't want to do it in the same pattern as Alan talked about. We want to mix those things up, but start looking for those opportunities that start to make sense for your operation. Excellent. And, and uh, Kent, while we're talking about that, uh, we actually have a question that, that is an excellent follow-up. Uh, the question is, what species of cover crops would be best great to, to be grazed by lactating cows, dry cows, and replacement heifers? Well, again, that answer nobody likes, but as always true, it depends. Again, context, context, context. Um, you know, we want those plant function, all three of those plant functional groups 
that both Alan and I talked about in there for diversity. Uh, we want to build that diversity in there. So if, if you're growing an alfalfa crop already, what can we add to that alfalfa crop to build that diversity in there? If you're growing a corn crop that you're going to combine, um, you know, we can look at adding things uh, that work not only well in shade, but also grow well um, during the cooler part of the year to come on strong, maybe for some late season grazing. So it depends on how you're using it, depends on how you want to use it. Um, one of the things we can do we've had great success with is producers will often call and say, I've got this hay field, it's just played out. You know, we've hate it and hate it and hate it. And if we can get animals to it in some way, shape or form, and there's lots of ways to do that, um, we can take our first crop hay, we can terminate that stand, we can go in with a complex cover crop that we can let grow uh, to midsummer or even all season, preferably all season. Uh, nickname for these are biological primers and then come in using the adaptive high stock density grazing, we can graze that. And oftentimes covers <clears throat> will include things like the sorghum sudan, some millets, some brassicas, a number of different legumes in those mixes. It's very easy to get to 10, 12, 13, 14 species pretty fast. And so um, those, those mixes are what provide some of that nutritional quality in the slide I had there uh, showing that it was basically dairy quality feed, even though a lot of that had been frost killed and was brown, it was still maintaining dairy quality feed. That diversity is both Alan and I talked about it's important for maintaining that feed quality. So think about diversity, uh, think about how it fits in your cropping system, think about um, what's the management been on there. One of the biggest things we have to watch is herbicide history, but most people in dairy have been pretty careful about that anyway, because of their rotation and other situations, that's a bigger issue. Um, think about when you might wanna use it and how you wanna use it. And there's, yeah, uh, that's a good place to start, and there's a lot of good options out there. Yeah, totally agree, Kent. And, um, you know, relative to that, we have another question, what cover crop cocktails would be good to replace corn silage? And to Kent's point, what we have found is that when we have highly diverse cover crop mixes, that oftentimes these are superior to our old reliable corn silage. Uh, in terms of cow feed. You know, our, our, our cows, our lactating cows in the milking stream can actually perform better on complex cover crop mixes that we ensile versus just straight corn silage. And sometimes this is hard for uh, ruminant nutritionists to wrap their minds around because they haven't experienced this. Uh, but that goes back to this diversity of phytonutrients that are present when we have a far greater array of plant species. And again, remember functional plant class groups. If you're feeding corn silage, first of all, you've only got one plant species and then set and you're adding other things in. I understand that to the ration, to the TMR. But secondly, you have a very, very narrow array of plant phytonutrients. And, and because you have a very narrow array of plant functional group, the groups that are represented in, in that feed stuff, these phytonutrients are so terribly important in animal health. And in almost all of our livestock rations and dairy rations are no exception. We can talk about a feedlot ration and a beef feedlot. We can talk about a ration for broilers, a ration for pigs in, in, in our uh, confinement pig operations and so forth. All of those are, are terribly lacking in plant phytonutrients. And that's the reason we experience a lot of animal health issues. This is really far more important than most people even begin to realize. And we, we start to see once we expose them to a higher array of phytonutrients in their diet, we start to see a lot of the health issues that we think are just inherent starting to disappear, go away, and we don't have to worry about them anymore. And, and we're experiencing that on our own farms and have many clients that are experiencing the same thing. So, so there's just a whole host of, again, compounding 
cascading benefits when we have this diversity present. Uh, now we have, Kent, we have another question here, and I'm going to throw this to you first, uh, that says, is there a wild plant that can grow in a pasture that is so toxic to cows that you would not allow your cows to graze in that area? So toxicity, as the toxicologists at the universities continue to tell me, is based on volume. Um, we have animals have to eat enough of it in order for it to be toxic. And if we offer animals a broad array of ample amounts of feed, a broad array of ample amounts of feed, the chances of toxic plant poisoning is extremely thin to non-existent. So like, for example, um, a lot of our complex cover crop mixes that we work with per dairy producers on include the sorghum sudans and the sudan grasses and the sorghums. And those are vulnerable to prussic acid, accumulating prussic acid, uh, either during drought or after a freeze. And alone, if we were just to plant a whole field of sorghum sudan and the heifers got out and went in there during a drought setting, or uh, right after a frost, yep, we're gonna have huge prussic acid, acid issues. But we have tens of thousands of documented cow days on complex cover crops where we're not forcing them to eat it down to the dirt, even after a killing, for immediately after a killing frost. I've had my own animals on this stuff immediately after a frost and watch them, stood out there and, and watch them eat some of this stuff but in very small amounts. And those small amounts are not toxic uh, to these animals. Um, toxic plants are often, a lot of toxicity to livestock happens to subordinate animals where they're short on feed, they're star literally starving, they've got nothing else to eat. And so they're forced to eat toxic plants in a quantity that's going to be either make them very ill or if not lethal. And I hear this time and time again, from the animal toxicologists at universities. We see animals out eating. I've watched my animals eat nightshade. I've watched them eat um, <clears throat> uh, plants that should be high in prussic acid, but there's enough diversity out there. I've watched them eat, we've watched them eat buttercup uh, out there and you think they're gonna tip over, but they just don't because there's enough diversity. If we stop and think about what pharmaceuticals are, it's basically controlled toxin being introduced to a body, whether that's to livestock or ourself from a vet or from our doctor. And it's done in a way that, that has a negative impact on what's ailing us, um, but not to the point where it's going to kill us. I mean, we can overdose on anything. We can overdose on oxygen. We can overdose on water. We can overdose on all sorts of things that are good for us. But in moderate amounts, as long as there's diversity there, we're just not seeing the problems. Alan, there might be a few things you want to add to that. I, I just totally concur. That's what we're seeing time after time, that the, the greater the degree of diversity and the array of functional plant class groups that you have out there, then we're just not experiencing any toxicity issues, even though there may be plants that are, that are known to be toxic in that mix. Uh, so just simply by giving your livestock the choice and the opportunity to graze from a multiplicity of plants, uh, you, you rarely, rarely get any kind of, of poisoning from, from the toxins in those animals. But the other thing to go along with that, Kent, is, you know, a lot of people, particularly in dairy, but if you're doing grass-fed beef production, you know, pastured protein production, then a lot of people say, well, if I've got you know, wild garlic, wild onion, or a host of other things out there, then I'm going to have a, a, a distinctive all flavor in my milk or, or in my beef. Uh, but that's also what we have found is those plants can be there, but if they're just a part of a much richer array of diversity in plant species, what actually happens is you get this incredibly rich and complex flavor profile that is very good. It's outstanding, as a matter of fact. And, uh, and so diversity actually improves the flavor of whether it's fluid milk, whether it's cheese, whether it's butter, yogurt, doesn't matter what it is. Diversity significantly improves the flavor of that end product. Um, okay, the next question 
is generally speaking, how does a 100% grass-fed dairy function? In other words, how does it function without a dependency on silage or grain? And it's a great question. And we, there are you know, a, a number of dairy producers around the US and Canada that are actively doing this now using 100% grass-fed dairies. And, uh, and that number is growing. Uh, so basically, first of all, it means that you have to be an excellent grazer. And yes, you need a high level of diversity out there as we keep hammering on in what they're grazing. Uh, you're, you can harvest some of this into baleage or silage but it, and feed that, and that still qualifies as a 100% grass-fed dairy because they're not getting any grain whatsoever. Uh, so you are, you're just harvesting, you know, the plants, the perennials and annuals that you're growing in that diversity to feed back as silage as well during periods of the year. We also, and Kent showed you some stockpiled towards the end of his presentation there in Minnesota. We, you can do a lot of stockpile grazing in the winter as well. So uh, it is absolutely doable, it's achievable. And as I said, there's a growing number of dairy producers that are doing this. Uh, Kent, anything to add to that one? Yeah, I really want to add because I'm 100% grass-fed dairy myself. And so the diversity is critical. The grazing skills are critical. But to make those work, as Alan said, observation, observation, observation earlier, you have to be an observer. You have to observe what are your plants doing. You have to observe how your plants are recovering. You have to observe your animal performance. Are you getting rumen fill on a regular basis? You know, are there coats? Uh, slicking up in the spring. What's their manure consistency like? What are they doing, uh, you know, every day in the bulk tank? One of the beauties of 100% grass-fed dairy versus grass-fed beef is you get data every single day. Every single time those animals run through the milking parlor, you're getting a data point to help track what's going on, what paddock they're coming out of, what the weather conditions are. <laughs> Again, cow comfort's critical. We can do that. Uh, silage or, or baleage, uh, or haylage, I should say, and baleage is going to be how you get through the cold months, but stockpiling's absolutely huge. Now, if you've got animals that are in a 100% confinement situation and you're feeding them TMR, um, we're going to have to transition uh, somebody who might be thinking about doing that into 100% grass fed. It's not going to happen overnight. The epigenetic thing is huge. You know, uh, Alan talked a little bit about the, the calf starting to learn in the womb of that cow uh, what's edible and what's not. Grazing, yes, it's, in, it's instinctive for cattle, but it's also a learned behavior and it's learned better over time. And that ep epigenetic effect is huge. It's something that if a person wants to work for, it can be done. It needs to be done in steps or stages. It needs to be done thoughtfully and carefully. But first and foremost, we need to get that soil health up and cranking, and we're going to do that through plant diversity. Yeah, uh, and, and Kent, that was a very important point. In today's dairy industry, there are many, many, many cows and heifers that, quite frankly, have little clue as to how to graze. Now, they may be out there on pasture, they may be nipping around and all of that, but they do not know how to feed themselves by grazing. And, uh, and so, as Kent said, part of that is epigenetic, and, and you, have to, you have to start building that into your herd. Uh, the next question is, are there computer models that take into account the function of biodiversity of cover crops and forages? Uh, so the short answer to that is yes, uh, you know, and no model works perfectly, guys, so recognize that. There's always strengths and weaknesses in any kind of model like this, but there are some models available, and on, on a couple of projects that we're actively working on, we're actually working with one of those models. Uh, so we, if you will contact Kathy, we would be happy to share that with you, the link with you, so that you can download that model yourself and play around with it. But also, in terms of designing a cover crop mix, uh, Green Cover Seed has an excellent 
uh, they call it a smart mix calculator. So on their website, greencoverseed.com, they have what they call the smart mix calculator. You can go and access that. And it's, it's one of the best tools that I've seen out there for being able to design mixes. And that model that they have tells you how well your mix is perform, will perform relative to things like building soil organic matter, grazing biomass production, uh, building nitrogen in the soil, nitrogen fixation, uh, fixing, uh, you know, runoff problems, erosion problems, and a whole host of other things. So they, they have little gauges there that as you alter that mix with different species and different seeding rates, it'll show you how well that, that mix will do to account for all of those different objectives that you have. Uh, so those would be two things that I would recommend. And uh, Kent, anything to add to that? Uh, not at this time. I think you got it. Okay, so the next question, and this is a really, really good question, is how do you balance adaptive grazing with milk production? So I'm going to start, and then Kent, I definitely want your input on this. But so... The first thing that I would say is that if you are practicing true adaptive grazing, you are balancing those two things automatically. Oftentimes what happens here when we hear people say, well, I tried adaptive grazing, but man, it, it sure didn't help with my milk production. I, you know, my milk production went way down or my milk component production went way down. Well, you weren't adaptive grazing, okay? That's, that's what we have to understand, that there, there were definitely some things that you were doing that were not adaptive in, in that grazing application. Uh, every time you adaptive graze and you're truly applying the three rules, and as Kent said, observing, observing every day, then you can easily merge and marry the two. You can have excellent milk and, and milk component production to go along with the adaptive grazing. So, uh, you know, this would be a thing that for any of you that are out there that, that, that have tried this and you've had some issues, feel free to contact us individually so that we can, we can talk about your context and we can understand your context, what you've been doing, what you've tried, and we can boil it down to what the, the hang-ups were for you, and we can help you with, with getting past those. So we, we certainly welcome that. Kent, uh, anything to add to that? Yeah, um, basically it's observe, as Alan said, and then adapting or adjusting, and that requires more observation. Um, you need to know what your forage inventory is out there. You need to know where your paddock recoveries are out there. You need to see how your animals are performing. And again, you're getting that data point every time those animals run uh, through your milking facility. So adjusting and adapting uh, accordingly. Building diversity in your system. Boy, I've seen that on my own place. It's like the more diversity, plant diversity we build in, uh, the far better those animals do. The other part of that question I want to address a little bit here is, you know, concerns about loss of pounds of milk per cow per day. And that's been the metric most dairy farmers have. That's been the gold standard of dairy farmers for a long time. But I think we need to change our focus. I think we need to change our focus to what is your net return, your net financial return per pounds of milk produced or per cow or and or per acre. We need to look at net. What's our bottom line? We've had this long-term focus. Yes, we need pounds of milk from a cow. Yes, yes, yes. That's a given. Do we need the am amount of pounds of milk we're getting per cow uh, on, on some dairies? If it's not profitable, I would say no. If it is prof profitable, great. Keep going. Make it happen. But so many dairies are struggling profitability-wise where commodity milk prices have gone and even the drop in organic price. Um, and they've really struggled with that. Um, what's, what, is our, what is each individual dairy's cost of production? 
And, and what is going to be your net at the end of the day and at the end of the year? Knowing those financials are crucial. And I would argue that it's more important that we work towards net than it is towards pounds of milk per cow, which has been the long-term standard. So um, let, I would encourage us to think about that and uh, uh, as, as we move forward. Thanks, Kent. And uh, Kent, I'll have to say our, our, our guys participating this evening were slow to start to ask questions, but now they are pouring in. So we, <laughs> we, we open the floodgates. <laughs> we, we have a long list of questions ahead of us. Uh, so the next question is, how low can we get with enteric methane release? So we, we did mention that. And uh, so the way I want to address that is this way. It, we, we talk about that in the industry. You know, we talk about, okay, how can, we, how can we reduce the enteric methane release from our cattle, either beef cattle or dairy cows? That's what we got to do. That's what we got to do. Well, he, here's the problem, folks, is that that's a natural process, okay? And all the wild ruminants, whether you talk about deer or elk or bison or wildebeest or elephants or whatever, they all release enteric methane. And, and we have to be very careful here. If we start trying to introduce artificial methods, feeding something or whatever to reduce enteric methane too low, then we're going to produce some unintentional negative compounding effects on our, on our livestock and the way that their, their bodies function. So we, we've got to understand that. And really what we're talking about here is not, you know, how low can we get enteric methane release? What we're talking about is how do we get proper methane functioning and cycling Okay, that's really what it's all about. Because again, guys, remember, for millennia, we've had hundreds of millions of wild ruminants roaming this earth, and they, their rumens work the same way as your dairy cows rumen, and they, they release methane as well in their digestive process. They burp, just like your dairy cows do, and, and release methane. And so it's about re-establishing the microbial organisms in the soil that have always taken care of that, like the methanotrophs and so forth. And that's really what we need to do. If we restore the microbial balance to the soil and the population biomass, then the centric methane release is no longer a problem. It's taken, in our flux tower technology is already telling us that. We're not we're not doing anything that significantly reduces the enteric methane release with adaptive grazing and regenerative. Rather, what we're doing is we're restoring the natural cycling of that methane that has happened for millennia. That's, that's what we got to do. So, Kent, anything to add to that? Yeah, you know, if we look back, there was an estimated 120 million elk and 60 million bison in North America pre-Christopher Columbus, not to count deer and pronghorn and Rocky Mountain sheep and mountain goats and all those other thing, things that were out there uh, releasing methane. And uh, so the numbers were huge. It's like Alan said, it's been around for millennia that these animals have been there. You know, most of it's coming from, from belching, not from flatulence is mistakenly thought of all the time. And most of that is happening when, if we've got cattle out grazing, in a healthy sward, in a healthy soil system, the bulk of that's happening with 18 inches or less of that soil surface. If we have healthy micro populations, as Alan said, we're restoring that cycle in that community and it's a natural thing. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's how we address it. Uh, that's how we can address it. Uh, and when we understand the system, I think it, it allows us uh, opportunity to challenge the people who say it can't be addressed except through artificial means. Excellent. Thanks, Kent. Uh, so, Kent, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you on this next question. It's, uh, it says, we mentioned the lowering of the legume component in the mix. 
can we provide an example of how much of the legume component we'd like to see in a cool season annual mix for grazing dairy replacement heifers? Uh, and the particular uh, writer of this question says, I've been keeping it between 20 and 30% in my mix. So Kent, what, what do you recommend here in terms of total percent component of legumes in a mix? Yeah, the, the writer's getting pretty close. Uh, if we look at natural systems, it was about 10 to 20%. Um, we've way overshot that mark. Um, and that can have negative consequences, not only to our livestock, but even our biota and the soil. Um, just too much nitrogen in the system, the system doesn't work correctly. And so 10 to 20% is what we want to go with. And, and I hope all the dairy producers are sitting down when they hear that, because uh, that's <laughs> counter to what we've been hearing for many, many years. So uh, I'd start with that, Alan. Anything you want to add? Well, I would, I would completely concur, and that is exactly what we have found. Uh, it, actually, we, we create a host of negative compounding effects when we have too much legume in the mix, uh, starting with creating nitrogen and ammonia imbalances in the bodies of our cattle uh, that creates a subclinical stress and that leads to higher incidences of things like uh, pink eye and foot rot uh, you know, mastitis, things like that. So we're actually creating a lot of our own issues with having way too high of a legume component in the mix. We're also throwing our carbon to nitrogen ratio of the soil way out of whack as well. Uh, when we have too much legume component, we've got way too much nitrogen relative to, to carbon in the soil and and that creates issues for our soil microbial population to be able to function adequately. Um, and, and since we're talking about nitrogen, I do want to mention one thing here. One of the things that we've been very successful in using with, with many of our clients to help them on making fertility decisions in their crops and in their pastures is the Haney test, H-A-N-E-Y, the Haney soil test. And the Haney soil test allows us to be able to look at not only the inorganic nitrogen component that all of our standard soil tests look at and, and estimate, but we can also determine the organic nitrogen component in the soil. And so often what we find is that the standard soil test significantly underestimates the amount of actual nitrogen available to our plants and that leads us to over applying nitrogen on our crops time and time again and that creates a whole host of other negative compounding effects that, that we can dive into at a later point but, uh, but by using the Haney test we can more adequately and appropriately apply nitrogen and significantly reduce our nitrogen cost. Um, all right, Kent. Alan, and then, Alan, Alan one yep. other thing I'd like to add to that. So, you, you know, the organic, you know, inorganic thing. We we we've known for a long time that inorganic nitrogen is highly plant available, but it, that organic nitrogen is so important. Up to forty some percent of the nitrogen plants used is coming from organic nitrogen. And a lot of that's coming just through good active soil biology. And you know th those are organisms too, and those organisms poop. And just like we value manure in the dairy system, that manure coming off those soil organisms has value to that system, so. Exactly. So the next question is, says, my question involves the rule of disruption. What about altering the direction of brake wires in a paddock? For example, set it up parallel in one paddock, horizontal the next time, diagonal one way or another the next time. Uh, how would that affect both the livestock and the soil biology? Well, and Michael asked that question, so I'll start with this and then Kent uh, ask you to interject here. But uh, so Michael, uh, yes, that is absolutely a way to be disruptive. Uh, if we alter the direction of our brake wires in a paddock from time to time, that very definitively alters the way that they graze that paddock and therefore impacts the cellular memory of the microbes, the plants, and the animals grazing that paddock. 
So yes, that is certainly one way that you can introduce a planned purposeful disruption. Kent, anything to add to that? Yeah, Michael, you get an A for the day. You're a quick learner. You're spot on. Uh, good work. All right, Ken, I'm going to start with you on this one. The question is, what is your opinion on stockpiling for a 100% grass-based dairy? I live in the coastal southeast where cows are on grass 365 days a year and looking at the upper Midwest where I will, where I will have to pay more attention to seasons. So, um, so he's looking at potentially the upper Midwest, but he, right now he's in the coastal southeast. So Kent, and this is from Jacob. So your opinion on stockpiling and grazing stockpile? Absolutely. Do all you can. We try to do all we can. One thing to be aware of is you may lose some energy the longer you go into the fall with that. Um, that's probably the biggest thing we lose. Uh, stockpile grasses are going to probably be best for um, dry cows and heifers. Again, class of livestock being appropriate to the context is, is very critical on how we use that. Not that it can't be used, but just understand that you may start losing energy the later we get into the season. Um, but I do recommend it. We do use it as long as possible. Typically in the upper Midwest, we get shut down on stockpile before we lose uh, a lot of our nutrient value. We'll get a deep, heavy, wet snow, November-ish, early December. That'll pretty much make that stockpile forage uh, unavailable. And then we're going to move to um, like a complex cover that's got the ability, some of the plants have the ability to stay erect through the snow and the animals can work down and find a very balanced ration and then move into something like bale grazing uh, of, of stored forage uh, later in the year. So context is huge, but definitely take advantage of that and use it as much as possible. Absolutely. And, and of course, I do live in the southeast and uh, stockpiling is a very important part of our grazing program on an annual basis. And we stockpile and graze both perennials and annuals uh, and love stockpile grazing both of those. But I will say that success with stockpile grazing, just like success with any other type of grazing, is greatly enhanced if you have greater diversity of plant species. So the more diversity, the more successful your stockpiling and your stockpile grazing is going to be. Uh, so Kent, the next question from Andy. Andy says, is moving into complex mixes of crops simply a trial and error process, or can I get support to create and manage these complex mixes? Absolutely. Uh, Alan already talked about green cover seeds. Um, Smart Mix Calculator, great place to start. Um, when you go through that calculator, it asks you to identify some goals uh, there and a little bit of your how you're going to use it in a rotation. And from that, uh, when you get into selecting species, it will give you ranked uh, species that are ranked. And I would say nine times out of 10, you select the top ranked species based on your goals. Um, you're going you're gonna to do a pretty good job on selecting a cover crop mix that's going to work based on those goals. So you do have to identify what you want to accomplish out there first. And, and hopefully it's more than just feed for your animals. Hopefully you're looking to uh, address an erosion issue or stimulate mycorrhizal fungi or build soil organic matter. And we can achieve multiple goals on any given field um on how as we go about designing these cover crops and grazing them so uh that's a great tool to start with um there's you know understanding ag is a is a consulting entity and so we provide those services also um so those are two great places to start the other is just talking to people in your area what are they using for covers we've got more and more people all the time using covers for a variety of reasons ask what kind of soils are using them on uh, some of it's just beef producers um, doing it to extend the grazing season, but find out what works for them. You know, kind of the formula for grazing that works for putting gain on steers is pretty much the same formula, if you will, uh, to put milk in the bulk tank. And so there's a lot of crossover stuff we can use from beef producers, uh, grass finish 
grass finishers who are using complex covers uh, as part of building a forage chain to help you do that. There's webinars uh, on this out there that can help you design that also. I, I don't recommend just sort of a random um, throw darts at the board and see what happens sort of a thing. I think a little bit of thought behind this and a little bit of research can go a very, very long way. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you, Kent. Uh, so the next question from Jacob is uh, uh, pointing back towards the, the emissions issue. Uh, Jacob says, I've heard that some species of forbs like plantain that can be worked into perennial hay crop can actually lower greenhouse gas emissions from cows. Is there any truth behind that? So, so Jacob, yes, there, there, there is some truth to that. And, and again, the greater the diversity, the, the, you can actually lower the enteric emissions from cows with a higher level of plant species diversity. Now, can you lower it all the way to where some scientists say they have to be lowered? No, but again, we don't need to because if we've got that diversity out there, we're, we're starting that process of lowering these emissions, but we're coupling that with the diversity, building that microbial profile that is needed to cycle these emissions and to take care of them. So the combination of those two factors working for you through higher diversity in your plant species allows us to be able to basically mitigate this methane emission and, and other greenhouse gas emissions from cows. And again, we're the, the flux tower data is clearly showing that that is the case and, and we're continuing to see that. So, uh, and the other thing that the flux tower data is doing is it's a tremendous teaching tool. So it's gonna allow us to, to get better and better at this as well. So Kent, anything that you'd like to add? Not much, I think you got it. All right, Kent, I'm gonna start with you on this one from Teresa. Teresa asks, when is the best time to interseed corn for grain? So I, I'm assuming she means that the corn is going to be harvested for grain production, not silage. So when would you want to time your interseeding of your, of your cover crop in that corn? Yeah, we want to get it in early enough for those cover crops to get established before that corn canopies out. Most of our corn is now planted to uh, facilitate canopy to minimize any competition from other plants. But once those plants in the understory are established, they can lie there dormant until the plants uh, begin uh, have matured and begin to dry down or and the canopy opens up. So um, I'm a big fan of shooting for about three V3 to V5, uh, if at all possible. A lot of recommendations you'll see out there are V5 to, V5 to V7. There was a lot of fear that uh, the cover crops would would substantially hurt that corn crop. Um, we're not seeing that even at three V three V four. You know, one of the common cover crops used with interseeding corn is annual ryegrass, and it can take seven to ten days for annual ryegrass um, to emerge, to germinate and emerge after it's planted. And so, if you're planting at V three V four you know, and that's going to be early June for most, for a lot of us in the upper Midwest, um, that, that corn's growing pretty rapidly. And in, in seven to 10 days, how much further is that going to be along before that little tiny annual rye plant sticks its head up uh, above the soil? Um, not a lot of competition there. So the, the, it's, there's a sweet spot there and we find uh, that works pretty good. As we move further east, Illinois, Indiana, uh, Ohio, um, there's a much better success for putting cover crops on later in the year, um, later in August, um, and getting them established that way. Uh, but as we move farther west where rain is a little more iffy, uh, that becomes a little more difficult. So again, it kind of depends on where you are, um, but we're finding that for most people, the highest degree of success is that V3 and V4, and then getting it in the ground so we have good seed to soil contact, um, especially if you've got crusting issues on the soil. We need to watch that. 
Um, some people can get by with broadcasting with really good soil aggregation out there. Um, but if you're early in the game, uh, you may not be there yet. And so we've got to add a few tricks to improve our chances of success and some sort of drill or some application like a modified rotary hoe or something that can flick uh, some soil on top of those seeds can help ensure success. Totally agree with that. Seed to soil contact is still very important. Uh, so thank you, Kent. Um, all right, so Kent, next question is from Michael. And Michael says, we are a 100% grass-fed organic dairy. I partnered with a retiring dairyman and he has always post clipped. Uh, so, you know, he, he's clipping the pastures after grazing. Uh, so I feel that post clipping low is like over grazing. Is post clipping shocking the grass again if done within a few days of grazing? Yes, and yes. <laughs> very, <laughs> yeah. very much so. Um, you were spot on. And, and it's that second bite we're always concerned about in grazing and clipping functions exactly like that. You know, there was a school of thought at one time, and it's still out there, and Alan mentioned this, is this, this, this effort to keep grass in this highly vegetative state, and yet we know that's counterproductive to the animals, that's counterproductive to soil health, it's counterproductive to the forage, and that clipping, especially a couple days later, can, can be very detrimental. In fact, my guess is, is their pasture is often stalled out on forage production, uh, and maybe even we're going backwards over time uh, because of that. Now, does that mean if you've got an issue somewhere you wouldn't want a spot clip? I guess that's a context issue. You know, if the county weed inspector is rapping on your door and says you need to deal with thistle or something like that, that's different than clipping everything all the time as a routine management tool. Very different context. But it is something that I think it's, it's, it's exactly like you said. It's that second hit or that second negative impact to that plant. It's going to be detrimental to the plant. And if we do that, we need to expand out our recovery period. And so it's going to take that much longer to come back to that just because of the severity and the repeated impact out there. So, Alan, anything you want to add to that? Well, the thing that I would add is... Uh... It, it takes biology to grow biology. You can never grow biology mechanically or chemically in the soil. And clipping is a mechanical application. So it costs money. You've got labor, you've got fuel, you've got maintenance, you've got repair, all of those depreciation, everything. When, when you have that equipment and you're running that equipment, and, uh, and, and as Kent said, it, it's, it's producing a second detrimental impact. And it's certainly not biological. My cows are biology. They're shedding biology. They're shedding microbes and their saliva from their hair coat and their manure. Every time they move across my fields, when they tug on the plants to graze, that creates a biological impact, a recognized biological impact by the microbes in the soil. Uh, so I want biology growing biology. I, I don't want to spend money running machinery over my fields when I don't have to, and especially when it, it, it's producing a negative rather than a positive impact. Uh, Alan, right. one other, yeah. Alan, one other thing on that is, you know, adjusting stock densities to deal with that is, is really the biological way, yeah. as Alan said, to deal with that. And so if, if we're probably, if there's a lot of seed head out there, um, we're probably not grazing uh, at high enough stock density. And so altering those, high, high, altering those stock densities to deal with that is another way to address some of that if we're concerned about too many plants are going to, to maturity and as a way to build diversity. Exactly. So the next question um, is from Connor, and Connor asks, are there any species of cover to avoid with regard to milk production? I'm thinking of when I was growing up and hearing my grandfather cursing his herd getting into wild onions. So uh, Connor, I can relate to that. My grandfather did exactly the same thing. So, uh, so here's the deal with that, again, Diversity, diversity, diversity. Brassicas can create issues. So if I have too much turnip, too much radish, kale, things like that in the mix, 
then I can have issues with all flavor related to that, just like I can the wild onion. So, but if I have any of those and all of those, including wild onion growing up and wild garlic and so forth, but I have a high degree of diversity, you're simply not going to have a problem with regard to the flavor of the milk. Uh, so, so it's still the same answer. Diversity is what counts and what allows us to be able to alleviate those problems. Um, so Kent, next question um, from Angela. Angela says, do you test the grass and use a nutritionist to pinpoint what the cows are getting out of the pastures? How would you know what they are lacking? So again, diversity, diversity, diversity. And using a thing like a refractometer, we can, we can do some of our own monitoring by just using the refractometer as a tool to determine when and what paddocks we're moving those animals to uh, can go a long way to doing that. Forage analysis is a great thing to do. If Again, we talked about stockpile grass earlier, just monitoring that to see if you've got some energy drop uh, out there. Um, and making adjustments uh, based on that can be very valuable. So uh, yeah, we can use those things. We can make those adjustments. Some of the diversity, for example, some of the covers and stuff don't fit so cleanly in some of the nutritionalist models. Um, and, and some nutritionalists loathe the idea of that, um, having to deal with that because it's, it's a bit more of a guess. A lot of those models are built on uh, blending monocultures that there's a lot of data built around and we just don't have the data to do that and so get, they get a little excited about that sometimes but using a refractometer and bricks and a lot of diversity can go an awful long way to monitoring and managing uh, what you have out there. Absolutely and we we use uh, bricks measurement routinely uh, far far better and more accurate on a day-to-day -day basis than clipping grass and sending samples into the lab. By the time you do, first of all, you're, you're likely clipping a lot of grass that your cattle are not even eating. You're clipping too far down on the plant and sending that in for analysis. Uh, you need to be testing what your cows are actually eating. So that means you need to be observing while they're grazing to see what they're eating off of the plants. And that's what you want to test. Uh, whether you're doing it by using a refractometer to test bricks or whether you're going to clip and send it to a lab, you need to be testing what the cows are actually eating so that you know what they're actually consuming in the way of nutrients. Uh, and again, we, we keep harping on this, but diversity is crucial here. If you have a high enough level of diversity, they're not going to be lacking. And this is where I Again, in, in my past life, I was a university professor. And, uh, and, and I can tell you that many, many ruminant nutritionists have an absolute hang up on this. They cannot comprehend in their mind, and it's certainly not on their computer in the program, the software they're using, how to look at grazing and, and, and manage the nutrient intake from cattle on grazing and none of their programs, none of their software accounts for phytonutrients in plants. So, so we have real issues when we look at this from what I would call a traditional ruminant nutritionist standpoint. They're going to miss this every time. Uh, they have to relearn how they do things as well to be able to get an accurate assessment of the total nutrition that the cattle are consuming. So Kent, we're, we're, we're hard up against 9.30. We're going to take one more question. But before we do, uh, I want to say that there, there's still a number of questions and comments that we did not get to. So please submit those to Kathy, and we will get to your question or comment. We greatly appreciate all of them, uh, but we don't want to keep people all night. Uh, so. Uh, so we will respond to your questions uh, if you'll go ahead and submit them to Kathy. So uh, Kent, the last one that I'm gonna pose to you is from Daniel in Missouri. Daniel says, we plant cereal rye behind corn silage in Missouri. 
in a mild winter like this past winter, we can sometimes get four grazings before termination in the spring. What can I add to the cereal rye that will regrow, survive freezing temperatures, and add to dry matter production? Yeah, great question. Um, other winter biennials, uh, hairy vetch, winter wheat, uh, triticale, uh, great places to start. Um, yeah, those would be some great places to start right off the top that I can think of. Alan, do you get any more? Uh, I, I absolutely agree. And, uh, and Daniel, again, we can help you with some very specific recommendations for your area. Uh, that's what we also have to remember is that, uh, that certain species and certain cultivars within those species you know, work best depending on where you are. Uh, so, so that has to be considered as well. And, and again, we can help in that regard. So again, we wanna thank everybody for being on this evening. Thank you so much for your questions and your comments. We, for those that we didn't get to this evening, we will respond to those for you so that you can have that feedback from us uh, and Kathy will be sending you out the survey forms. Please do fill those out and get those back to us because that helps us to, to make, to continue to improve our webinars and the content that we deliver to you. So thanks everybody. Have a great evening and we will be signing off.